Segway, to continue at once with the next musical selection or composition. Segway, to make a transition directly from one section or theme Segway, to another. Segway, to move smoothly and unhesitatingly from one state, situation, condition, or element to another. Segway, to perform in the manner of the preceding section. Segway, to make a transition from one thing to another smoothly and without interruption. This is Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the College of Arts and Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hello, everybody. Dr. Jeff Manuel was born in Fargo, North Dakota, and grew up in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. He obtained his bachelor's degree in history and economics from Northwestern uh, 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 University in Illinois and his master's and doctorate degree in history from the University of Minnesota. Today, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Historical Studies at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Welcome to Segway, Dr. Manuel. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. These days, we are commemorating, so to speak, the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I. And although most people know it existed because there was a World War II, <laughs> I wonder if, as a historian, you have a sense that the majority of the public really know uh, what that war was all about. That's a great question. I think that the answer differs depending on where you stand. I think we're seeing the commemoration of World War I, which will start, I think, really in earnest this August. In Europe, it's going to be a much larger event uh, where the historical memory of World War I is a lot more powerful, and I think the legacy of it is uh, much seen as being much stronger. In the U.S., yeah, I think you're exactly right that World War I is always a little bit of a mystery to most average Americans. They kind of remember that it was there, like you said, because it's the thing that came before World War II. <laughs> Uh, but many people, when pressed, might have a little bit of a hard time explaining the process that led the U.S. into the war, uh, what exactly it was all about, and sort of the exact chronology of it in the U.S. Can we say that the World War II was a direct consequence of World War I? Well, that's a question I think that's occupied historians ever since World War II started. Uh, but certainly, you know, many of the conditions that lead to World War II would have been impossible without World War I, specifically the way in which World War I was resolved with the Treaty of Versailles and very complicated dynamics. And in the U.S., and again, I'm a U.S. historian, so that's my expertise, uh, you know, there is in the U.S. the failure of the Senate to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, uh, a growing move towards isolationism coming out of World War I and all of these things. Okay. Now, to what extent was there an anti-German sentiment in the U.S. Uh, when the World War I started, or during the development of the World War I? There was a really large and significant anti-German, uh, we could even use the term hysteria, in the United States during World War I. Uh, and the history of World War I in the United States is quite complicated because the United States remains neutral at the beginning of the war. Uh, it sees the nations of Europe going into war. Uh, and the United States is, a, at the time, as it is today, is a diverse, multicultural nation. Uh, and people feel a lot of Americans have their allegiances pulled in a lot of different ways. There's a huge number of German Americans, either you know, themselves immigrants or maybe the children of immigrants in the U.S. at the time. Uh, there's many people of uh, British descent or who, who saw themselves as allied with uh, Great Britain. Uh, so in short, Americans are pulled in a lot of different ways. But once the U.S. does finally enter the war and Germany is the enemy, one of the ways in which the U.S. sort of pulled all of that together, pulled all these diverse strands together, was by focusing on anti-Germanism. Um, so there was a real sense that any expressions of uh, German language, German food, things like that became really suspect during the war, that if you spoke German at home, if you ate German food, if you worshipped in a German uh, language church, for instance. The Lutherans, for example. Yeah, the yeah. Lutherans, for example. Um, all of those were suspect, and it wasn't just that you were allied with the enemy. They began to sort of your own uh, patriotism could be questioned. And uh, that was really a flashpoint right here in southwestern Illinois, uh, as we'll talk about with the, with the case of Robert Prager. Uh, but it was really a nationwide phenomenon. And I find that interesting because in World War II, Germany was again the enemy of the United States, yet one has the feeling 
that most uh, some kind of quote unquote anti sentiment mm -hmm. was against the Japanese, not the Germans. So it seems to be a racial component mm -hmm. in that kind of motivation. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's exactly right, that there is a very strong racial component in the anti Japanese sentiment that you see during World War II. And a number of historians have written just really masterful books on this issue. But uh, in the case of the U.S.-German conflict in the European War in World War II, um, yeah, there's a sense that many Americans are, would say, oh, I don't hate Germans, I hate Nazis, or something like that. So that distinction was made that they didn't ally uh, you know, the racial characteristics of the Germans to the, with, uh, with the enemy in the way that they did just 30 years earlier in World War I. Despite the fact that the real, the most horrific crimes of the Nazi regime were not divulged until after Second World War with all the Holocaust uh, stories and everything else. So it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really, f I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, it's a, a, an aspect of American history that I've always been fascinated with and I think that a lot of people are fascinated with. And I think it's also a really interesting half century in terms of the evolution of beliefs about um, sort of ostracizing a group of people, racial belief, uh, racial identities, um, and the sensibility of anti-racism campaigns as well, that, you know, after World War II, it becomes clear that um, the horrors of national level racism become apparent to people, and a lot of Americans see sort of the, the problems of that, which leads us into the post-war era as well. But none of that was on the table in World War I, when there was really yeah. a sort of a wholesale, what they would have called at the time, 100% Americanism. Is there any comparisons we can make of those sentiments for both wars with the ones that develop after 9-11 with Arabs and, 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 and Islam in general? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, obviously there are some very significant differences, and we always have to be careful of that in history about not so saying, you know, the past or the, t the present issues are exactly like these ones in the past. Mm -hmm. But certainly, I think, you know, the, a sentiment that developed in some quarters in the United States after 9-11 that essentially drew really broad brush, uh, blanket blame of Muslim Americans for what had happened in 9-11 and ignored, you know, huge um, uh, aspects of, of, the, of uh, the terrorist motivations and things like that was similar to what happened prior to World War I and during World War I, where suddenly all things German get painted uh, with the brush of these are the enemy, uh, and that leads to some really terrible consequences. And there were, that was the case after 9-11 as well, when we saw, you know, mosques being attacked. Um, uh, in the, the work I've done with my students related to the Robert Prager lynching, you know, they immediately drew this connection and found, for instance, a case in Joplin, Missouri, where a mosque was, uh, or I, I believe it was a mosque or an uh, Arab-American cultural center was uh, a victim of arson twice Mandalay, after 9-11, yeah. yeah. and this was pretty common. So I think there was certainly, you know, you can certainly see echoes of that today. And there well. was, I think, was in New York, uh, a Sikh was uh, murdered by someone who thought this, is, this guy looks weird, must be a Muslim, so right. let's kill him. I right. mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the specific case uh, for, for this show that has to do with uh, Robert Prager. And that's probably one of the most famous uh, anti-German sentiments, uh, expressions during World War One. This is a guy who uh, most people haven't heard about him, but I think is an icon in many ways of that kind of anti-German sentiment. Tell our audience a little bit about who was uh, Robert Prager. So Robert Prager was a German immigrant. He was, he was born in uh, Dresden in Germany in the late 1800s, and uh, we don't know a tremendous amount his, about his background prior to uh, his arrival in the United States, but at some point he left home in uh, Germany, and like millions of other people in this time period around the beginning of the 20th century, immigrated to the United States. Yeah, I think he was a kind of teenager at that time? Yeah, he immigrated in his teens, mm -hmm. uh, arriving in the United States in 1905, um, and then made his way, as many German immigrants at the time did, to the cities of the Midwest. Uh, so cities like St. Louis, um, like Chicago, places like that, were real hubs for a lot of German immigrants, and especially in St. Louis, which had a very significant German immigrant population uh, all the way back to the middle of the 19th century. So he followed a pretty well-worn path 
at that point. And again, like I said, we don't have exact details about where he was and what he did in all of these years. Uh, there are some clues, however. He was arrested at one point in uh, Indiana and served a brief period of time in jail in Indiana for, steal for uh, theft. We don't know exactly what he stole. Uh, but then he continued, he was released uh, from prison and continued making his way around the, to Midwestern cities. Uh, we know that he worked as a baker. Um, and at some point he came to St. Louis and was working as a baker. And then in 1917, he came across the river from St. Louis City to the town of Collinsville, Illinois, um, to initially work as a baker and then eventually got a job in one of the coal mines there. And Collinsville at the time, was a coal mining town. Uh, you know, Collinsville has sort of started out as sort of a market agricultural town in the 19th century, but then really boomed around the turn of the 20th century as coal mining developed in Madison and St. Clair counties in Illinois. So uh, Collinsville, like other towns in this region, was really booming at the time in terms of growing populations and a lot more business activity, really centered on these coal mines that are producing coal for uh, businesses mostly in the St. Louis area. And that as well, actually, one of the uh, neighbor, neighboring cities to um, Collinsville is Glen Carbon. That's <laughs> where the name, name comes from, from about. Now, my understanding is that he was living in St. Louis when, at the time that uh, World War I broke. And also, I had read something interesting. Apparently, he tried to enter the U.S. Navy, enlist in the U.S. Navy. And, and But it wasn't clear whether he was trying to become a U.S. citizen or what was the story. What do you know about that, that portion of his life? Yeah, so there is some evidence. Uh, a, no a number of historians have tried to dig up as many clues as we have about who this guy was and what happened to him right in these years prior to his murder in 1918. And there is some evidence that he tried to enlist in the U.S. Navy when war broke out. He was, of course, a German citizen. He was born in Germany. Uh, but was rejected. The story goes that he was rejected because uh, he had, was apparently blind in one eye. Uh, he was described uh, by one contemporary in using the language of the time as a, quote, physical cripple. Uh, so he may be someone who we'd consider disabled in, in modern language. Um, and But by all accounts, he did what he needed. He, uh, followed the rules of the game, so to speak, about Germans living in the United States. Because once the US went to war, there was a real concern, whether valid or not, about uh, German citizens living in the United States. Would they be loyal? Would some of them potentially be spies or saboteurs? Uh, you know, in Robert Prager's case, that was not, he was not a spy or a saboteur. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Uh, but he was like many German Americans who was suspect and had to sort of prove his loyalty. Um, so he tried to enlist in the Navy. There's other evidence as well that he flew a large American flag outside of the rooming house where he lived in Collinsville as a way of sort of asserting his patriotism in public, perhaps to head off claims that he was uh, disloyal right, yeah. or, or not American enough as a German. Well, it's funny because, I mean, let's face it, what do you have to spy in Collinsville <laughs> in 1917? <Yeah. laughs> There's nothing to spy there <laughs> of national interest. Now, I also understand he did have some personality problems, and they, that may have contributed to some suspicion among some people. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, he's, from the evidence we have available to us today, uh, one thing we can say about him is that he was certainly a stubborn man. Uh, he responded forcefully when he felt like he was slighted in some way. It's not exactly clear what all of these conflicts were over, but for example, he was working as a baker in Collinsville uh, and was fired from that job. And the family who owned the bakery, who then fired him, said that there was a, some sort of conflict or a quarrel about something like that, and said that he had sort of a quarrelsome personality, that he would take offense and argue about things, but that it passed as well. Um, so there's to the extent that we can highlight flaws in Prager's nature or behavior that might have led to the incidents uh, of his murder in 1918. I mean, the one that kind of sticks, I think, is that he was sort of a quarrelsome person. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I, I would say real quickly that I think that sometimes has been held up over the years as explaining away or rationalizing his murder in 1918. And of course, you know, it's hard to say that just because someone is sort of a stubborn person that they deserve this particularly horrific end. Another allegation I have read is that he has some socialist leanings, which now wasn't that uncommon among uh, uh, European immigrants around that time, and certainly much, much earlier than, than uh, co the anti-communism hysteria of the 40s and 50s. 
Do you think in some way that kind of political leaning may have contributed to some suspicions about, suspicions about him? Yeah, that's exactly right. He was accused of uh, being having socialist leanings, but as you point out, you know, we really it's really important that we understand that in the context of the time, that this was, of course, well before uh, the Soviet Union was formed. The Russian Revolution is mm -hmm. just breaking out at this time period, uh, and socialism as a political doctrine was not mainstream in the United States, but was an accepted sort of uh, third party or movement radical movement at the time, stretching back into the, 19th, into the late 19th century. So it wouldn't have been at all surprising that a German immigrant minor uh, had socialistic leanings. And in fact, what we find is that the United Mine Workers Union, that was the union that worked in the mines in the, throughout, uh, southwestern, that, throughout southwestern Illinois, uh, had deep factions within it between a wing that was more conservative and patriotic and a faction that was more socialistic leaning and much more hesitant about supporting the war itself. Uh, and so Prager was certainly not alone among miners at that time period of having socialistic leanings. And in fact, some of those factional fights within the Mine Workers Union most likely were sort of the immediate causes that led to uh, the conflict that then leads down the path to his lynching. Something that I also found interested, interesting was the fact that he tried to join the union and he was rejected, which is rather unusual for a union to do. Do we know exactly why the rejection of his membership uh, application to the union? Well, we don't know exactly. Uh, the best accounts that historians have have come up with thus far indicate that he uh, he came on to work at the mine and sort of was a t it was you had to be part of you had to be a, a part of the United Mine Workers to get uh, one of the better jobs in the mine. He worked at the Donkville Number Two Mine which is in Maryville today. Uh, moder it, it was in Maryville at the time, and it's in modern-day Maryville. It's not there anymore. Um, and after working there for a while, he almost immediately attracted suspicion from other miners. We don't know exactly why that was, most likely because of his uh, you know, German, strong German accent, uh, perhaps because of his uh, stubborn nature or quarrelsome behavior. So we don't know exactly why that was. But almost immediately, uh, other miners become suspicious of him, and he allegedly asked some questions to the mine manager about the use of explosives in the mine. Uh, and it's very unclear why he did that, with some people saying it most likely was because he may have had his sights set on becoming a mine manager or being a more of a skilled technician type role in the mine. Uh, but for whatever reason, the rumor spread that he was a German spy. He was trying to steal explosives to blow up one of the mines. Uh, and when he then applied formally to uh, become a member of the United Mine Workers, uh, they rejected his application, which effectively meant he was fired mm -hmm. from the job uh, as a miner in, in Maryville at the time. Now, for, for those of uh, in our audience who are watching this interview through our webcam in the, um, in the uh, website of the College of Arts and Sciences, which is posted the Monday after this uh, show is aired, can you show a picture Robert Prager, so people ha can have a better idea Certainly. of what he looked like. Yeah, there is uh, one of the best existing photos we have of Robert Prager. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell from this photograph, but uh, he was allegedly quite a short man, mm -hmm. short in stature and mm -hmm. height, um, and uh, as we said before, may have been blind in one eye as well. Okay. Now, when all these rumors are started that apparently... Um, there were some people who were actually concerned about his well-being, right? And there were some suggestions that they asked the police to put him in custody just to protect him, right? But the police declined. Mm -hmm. Was that a common practice for the police to do something like that at that time? Yeah. Uh, it depends a little bit on, it always depends on the specifics of the case and uh, the context. But, you know, in the broader context, uh, this conflict between putting someone in police protective custody for their own benefit to sort of save them from uh, potential mob or vigilante violence was pretty common, but I should say it also was common for that protective custody to fail. You know, a very common and tragic story all throughout uh, this era of U.S. history is, of course, uh, vigilante justice and uh, the lynch mob, in most cases aimed at African Americans in the South and in the border states. And this sort of pattern where someone would be accused of a crime, most often falsely, 
uh, and they would be put in police custody to protect them from the lynch mob. And of course, the lynch mob would storm the jail and break in and pull them out of the jail t to murder them. Uh, this was, you know, a sort of a tragically common event in U.S. history at this time period. So this 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 was a part of a pattern that was not uncommon. Now, actually, a mob broke into his home, right, and took him out of his home, but then he was rescued by the police. How, yeah. uh, how, how was the chain of events? Because I guess someone called the police and told them, you know, you need to <laughs> rescue this guy, and yeah. somehow they, they did it. So what happens, uh, there's basically a, over the days of April 3rd and April 4th of 1918, a series of events play out that lead to Robert Prager's murder early in the morning on April 5th of 1918. And on Wednesday, April 3rd, uh, he's working after his shift ends at the mine. A group of miners single him out and accost him in the very small town at the time of Maryville, Illinois. Um, and they force him to kiss the American flag. This was a common practice at the time, sort of as a way of uh, uh, forcing people to show their allegiance and threatening them to kiss the American flag. He's paraded through the town of Maryville, accused of spying, and they say, you have to leave town. We, we, they're demanding that he leave town or else he'll be hurt. Um, and it's worth noting that they had done this to another miner earlier, and this happened in several other towns throughout southwest Illinois as well, this sort of pattern of attack and raising suspicions about the loyalty of miners, forcing them to kiss the flags. It wasn't the first time this had happened. Um, and later that evening, um, two leaders from the local United Mine Workers, they meet with Prager. They tell him that they fear for his safety. They uh, escort him back to his home in Collinsville. And uh, they say, tell him that he should go into protective custody. He declines to do that. And instead what he does is he writes up a um, manifesto of sorts accusing the mine, these specific workers in the Mine Workers Union of uh, failing to give him a just hearing under the rules of the union. Uh, and he makes mimeograph copies of that uh, and posts it throughout downtown uh, Maryville. So a really direct sort of pushback against these accusations being leveled against him. And this is where you can kind of see his stubbornness at work. Um, so he writes this proclamation to members of local union number 1802, posts about a dozen carbon copies of it all throughout Maryville. And he knows that this is going to really upset a lot of the, his fellow miners because he's calling out some other leaders of the mine workers. And naming union, names. And naming names, exactly. Yeah. And uh, he then goes back to his home. And then on um, April 4th, a group of miners who have now read the proclamation and are very upset about it, most likely nursed their grievances in one of the many, many saloons that catered to miners in the area at the time, they show up at his house in Collinsville. Uh, and they demand that he uh, leave town, basically. They give him just a few minutes to leave town. But this is about 9.30 p.m. Um, they had been, like I said, upset about the proclamation. At that point, Prager comes out of his house, again, reasserts his loyalty. He's alleged to have said, brothers, I am a loyal USA working man. Um, and, but he did at that time agree to leave town within about 10 minutes. And then for whatever reason, and we don't know why, uh, a couple people in the crowd that's at a, that, that is at his house uh, demand that he show even more loyalty. They say, come on out, and we're going to make you kiss the flag again and, and things like that. And he agrees to do so. He says, all right, brothers, I'll go if you don't hurt me. Um, and at that point, they take him out of, the, he, they take him out of his house. Uh, they take off his shoes and outer clothing. They drape him in an American flag. And they start parading him up and down the main street in Collinsville. Um, and it's really at this point that we're starting to see them morphing from uh, a, conf a you know, group of people just accosting or bullying someone, threatening his loyalty, to what's going to grow into you know, a lynch mob that's going to lead ultimately to murder. And then, like you said, eventually this mob grows enough that a, police, a Collinsville police officer sees what's happening, steps into the crowd, um, and takes Prager into custody. That is to say, they put him in jail in the Collinsville uh, jail. On main, right off of Main Street uh, for his own protection. And at that point, the crowd outside City Hall grows. Um, the rumor spreads very quickly that there is a German spy being held in the Collinsville jail. Um, and there's uh, people flood out of the um, saloons and bars that line Main Street and Collinsville at the time to see what's happening, be part of this crowd. A crowd of several hundred people gathers outside the steps. They demand to see and know uh, what's going on inside the jail and to see Robert Prager. Uh, the police 
do a couple things that look sort of silly in retrospect. They try and put, they have a fake get they they fake that he was taken away um, in a car, even though he wasn't. So a police officer gets in a car and pretends to drive away, but then walks back, and the crowd can see that obviously they didn't take him away. Uh, the mayor of Collinsville appeals to the crowd to say, you know, we're going to handle this. Let let this take its course through the legal system. Um, and at some point, the crowd, some members of the crowd, convince the mayor to that they should be allowed into the jail to search for Robert Prager because, again, the mayor is telling the crowd that Prager is gone at this point. And what they've done is they've taken him out of one of the cells and hid him in sort of a back room area of the Collinsville jail. Um, and so the crowd then streams into the jail to look for him. At first, they don't find him. And eventually, though, uh, one member of the crowd does, in fact, find him hiding under some sewer tiles down in the basement of the, of the jail. Uh, and at that point, they grab him by the arms and haul him back out of the jail. Uh, and it's really at this moment that the sort of march towards his uh, murder begins. And they take him out of the jail. And then he's hanged. Yes. Okay. Uh, so they march him down Main Street of uh, Collinsville, headed west towards the River Bluffs. Um, at the time, you know, with a there's a crowd, there's a the crowd is being led by a man waving the American flag. It's several people punch and attack him at the time, and it's quite a ways. They walk over a mile uh, with dragging him along, forcing him to sing patriotic songs. Um, at some point, some people leave the crowd. Uh, when a streetcar passes, and at some point they leave Collinsville city limits. The police apparently have been following along this whole time, and then once they hit the Collinsville city limits, the police drop away uh, to say, you know, there's nothing we can do yeah. once we're out of city limits. And at that point they reach the, the hanging tree. Yeah. And uh, Now, there were 12 people who were actually indicted for it, but all were acquitted, and nobody was found guilty. Hmm. I mean, in a small town at that time, everybody had to know who did it. Uh, was these type of crimes that come in the United States against Germans, and this is probably the last question I have for you in the, la in the last minute that we have, uh, uh, against Germans at that time, and they, get, were they actually getting uh, away with murder? <laughs> well, no. Uh, thankfully, the Prager case stands out to us particularly because it's really the high point of violence against Germans and German-Americans during World War I. Um, much more common. So it stands out by being actually a lynching and murder of a German-American. That's very unusual. Uh, but there were other lower key incidents of, for example, beatings, these flag kissings, uh, people being tarred and feathered uh, for being German or their loyalty being suspect mm -hmm. or refusing to quit speaking German or things like that. So Prager stands out and the case in Collinsville stands out uh, for its extremity, but it's an extreme version of what was a common practice of sort of suspicion uh, and in more extreme moments, attacks, and in this case, murder. Okay. Well, thank you very much to Dr. Jeff Manuel for this interesting uh, story uh, about something that happened in Collinsville, Illinois, in the, in, in the, uh, at the end of the Fair World War. And next week, we're going to have Wendy Greenwood, uh, SUE theater graduate, who will be talking about life after theater. So uh, stay tuned. This has been Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a production of the Department of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. All rights reserved, 2014.